Uh, we're going to take a look at issues of creativity and human-centered AI. We have uh, four papers here, and we'll be uh, starting off with Jason. Thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm Jason Ding, and I'm advised by Zhao Chen, our great MC for today. And today I'm going to introduce two projects. I will introduce the first one here and also uh, the last one in the, the, at the end of this session. So I worked on human AI collaboration, specifically just I try to build AI power system to improve people's creativity. So like this project, I will talk about how to use language models to write analogies to increase people's creativity. So an analogy is an abstract parallel between two different things like a high level connections between two things. So you can just imagine a case if you were a manager who had a, a strong tech background, which is quite common for researchers that like us, but not much manager experience. And you are looking for ways of dealing with a problem employee. So how to solve this problem? May, you may come up with an analogy of your engineering background that a, a problem employee could be like an analogy of a problem program. And you are quite familiar with how to deal with a problem program as an engineer. For example, you can uninstall the program or update the program, or you can search for communities. Yeah, so, and uh, in, the manager, man, in the managing role, you can also try to map the solutions for this analogy to your current situation. You can fire the employee or train the employee, or you can search for online communities that are managing communities. So we, we can see that analogy could be really helpful to increase people's problem solving capabilities, that the, their creativity. And the analogies can be even more powerful. It can save lives. For example, in the world, there are many people, there are many deaths caused by complicated births and they don't have the, the enough tools to like the high tech tools. But uh, an engineer, he developed a way of like use, try to like use a low cost tool to save people's life, like save the birth problem. So he used the analogy of extract the cork from one bottle and put, use that analogy to pull infant from the birth channel and it saves a lot of lives. So we can say analogies could be, could power creative breakthroughs by stimu stimulating effective problem reformulations and ideation. However, people often struggle to think of useful analogies to stimulate reformulations and ideation. So here we can try to use language models to help people. For example, like, so we can use the uh, GP3, which is a state-of-the-art language model. We use deep learning to produce human-like text. And we think this task is suitable for language model because of the several features of language model. The first one is that like, the language model can generate some new things. It's so like it can generate far away different things. And also it can just tailor the, tailor the output based on the inputs. So it's related, it's not nonsense. And also one like big drawback of the language model is can, is, it can produce some errors or like surprise to people. So, but like it could be even an asset for creativity. For example, if we provide some like surprising things, maybe it can also like try to treat people their creativity. And also people can make the final judgment of whether they want to go to that route or not. So in our, prelimin in our preliminary evaluations, we found that language model can do really good. And due to the time limitation, we can, I cannot show all our explorations with the language model, but I can just show one. And if you want to know more, please go to our poster session and I, I will tell you. Yeah, so it's one example. So. We need to help the language model to understand the core components of a problem. For example, we put a problem and we define several components of a problem, like the stakeholder, the people, and also the context, that's the situation, and also the goal and also the obstacle. We try to help you, we try to generate some analogy with which has a similar similar goal and obstacle, but a different stakeholder and context. So the original problem is that people want to find some fun place to visit, but they don't have enough information, lack of information, the information sitting problem. And we use the GPT-3 model to generate an analogy of like a base owner who want to increase the revenue, but he doesn't have enough information. And we can try to borrow some wisdoms from, from that situation. 
to solve the information system problem of that just like the normal people. So I want to, so if you are interested in our project, please talk to, uh, to me. And thank you again for coming, thank you. And basically we'll be returning at the end of this session as he moves from analogy to inspiration, a full life cycle creativity scholar. Uh, next up in your program, you see uh, we have Susanna Palitz listed uh, for talking about uh, team cognition. Unfortunately, she's unable to join us in person. So Sarah Valkamp has very graciously agreed to come on in and cover this talk. So Sarah, please, the audience is yours. So hi, I'm uh, Sarah Valkamp. I am a second year PhD student here at UMD's iSchool. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Letters mentioned, Dr. Palitz has a family health situation. So I will be doing the presentation today. So as you can see for this project, we've had many colleagues and collaborators uh, from a variety of institutions. So the problem we're looking at is team cognition demands for intelligence analysis shift handovers. And when we're talking about shift handovers, you wanna think of uh, like nurses. So someone leaves their shift and has to tell all the information from that shift to the person that's coming on the job next. Uh, it's because there's multiple people working asynchronously. In the intelligence analysis field, this comes across in 24-7 or crisis work, in which an analyst will work on a problem, have all the information get pulled away for whatever reason, another analyst needs to jump in on the same problem and provide the information without losing any of the work that was previously done. So uh, the team cognition we're looking at is uh, under con conditions of information overload. There's just information coming at them from all over the place. Uh, we're also looking at inaccuracy blindness. Uh, so this is when analysis won't question the assessments of the analyst, analyst prior to them. And then we are looking at difficulty achieving shared mental models and transactive memory systems, which is how you know what other people know. So it's sort of a division of labor of knowledge management. So our goals are how can AI improve team cognition in the context of intelligence analysis shift handovers. Uh, to start with, we interviewed nine current or retired intelligence analysts for platform requirements and task ideas. We also designed and developed software platforms and research paradigm to run the experiments. We're starting off testing AI versus no AI, uh, but then we're gonna move on to test different types of AI. Uh, so to do this, we created a task and then to prevent any bias from knowledge of the current political situation, we created a fictional world set 10 years in the future. So we're asking uh, our participants to act as intelligence analysts for a country named Bulgaria, which broke off of the Stratocovian Empire, which you can see there on the map. Uh, we're presenting them with ambiguous troop movement within the Stratocovian border. So the green up there to the pink, there's ambiguous troop movement that's been reported. And we are requesting that they evaluate the troop movement to make sure there is troop movement and then why it might be happening if there is. So we're providing information overload through reports, maps, social media, news, a ton of documents that we've created within this world. Here's an example of our platform. It's configurable for both tasks and materials. So as you can see, the, the sun up there is our AI, we refer to as Illuminate. So we use it to provide uh, summaries of documents and also uh, some topic modeling for our uh, participants. We also have the directory on the left, which lists, uh, gives the availability for all the documents, which are generally there in the beginning, but continue on to provide them during uh, the experiment. So number three is the view pane there, and that's where they can see their information. And the participants also have a scratch pad at the bottom there where they can write down any information. It's a 45 minute task, so they can write down any information to remember as they go through. So these are time tasks. They have a timer at the top, and we also give timed alerts throughout the experiment. So there's a uh, search and copy paste ability in this, and we also capture keystrokes, timestamps, things like that. Uh, but really helpful is it's interoperable with both Qualtrics and Mechanical Turk. Our next steps are to finish pilot testing, and then we're going to move into data collection. We're going to be looking at the effects of a simple AI intervention. So do they have that illuminate symbol and that those summaries or not? And then we're going to benchmark the study where we compare our MTurk participants to actual intelligence analysts or people who work in jobs that require significant problem solving. Uh, and then we're gonna test the effects on solution quality and team cognition. Uh, so if you have any questions, we don't have a poster, but I will be at the poster session, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. 
I would now like to introduce Sarah Volkamp for our third talk uh, in the Creativity and Human-Centered AI, specifically focused on creativity and AI and its relationship to human work. So as some of you may know, I'm Sarah Volkamp. I'm a PhD student here at UMD's iSchool. Uh, so I study human-centered AI, and I'm particularly focused on creativity, AI, and work, which coincidentally this talk is about. So I'm going to be discussing an in-progress paper that I'm working on to develop a research plan for an interdisciplinary approach to understanding the confluence of AI, creativity, people, and work. Uh, so there's lots of research about repetitive or low-skill work, as some economists refer to it. And for lack of a better term, you can think of this as blue-collar work. Um, in the past few years, though, some research has indicated that knowledge work might not be as safe as we uh, previously recognized. So similarly, creativity is often pointed to as a safe job or safe aspect of job. So my question is, how accurate is that actually? So we've seen AI write books, write poems, write scripts. It's used critical thinking to win games, and it's even worked as an advertising creative director, among many other creative endeavors. So maybe our question should look a little different. Will our robot overlords take all the fun out of work from us? Or do we need to take the time to deliberately approach this before we need a solution and have to be reactionary? So my approach for my first foray is to work from three research questions listed here. So I'm looking into which occupations require creativity, what creative skills AI currently possesses, and what occupations are then at risk for increased AI augmentation, or replacement because of creative tasks. I've used these questions to inform a qualitative content analysis of occupation and competency data, as well as AI creative ability, with the hope of identifying areas of overlap. And given the interdisciplinary nature of these questions and growing corpus of information, this project has required a lot of scoping. To start with, uh, definitions took a long time. So first I needed to define creativity and I pulled um, Cognitive psychologist Margaret Bowden works specifically with artificial intelligence and creativity, and her definition, she defines creativity as the ability to come up with ideas or artifacts that are new, surprising, and valuable. For AI, I broadly used Norvig and Russell's uh, concept that systems act rationally, and I was looking specifically at narrow AI because that is what exists. So here's an example of an occupation as defined by the Occupational Network from the U.S. Department of Labor. So the first two columns, the occupation name and the description come directly from ONET, and the second two columns are results from the analysis. Uh, so I coded the description for existence of any term that indicates a requirement for creative ability that is not modified by terms like assisting with or implementing someone else's work. And the category writing here, it's one of seven that I'll discuss more on the next slide. The creative work requirements are generally writing, but there are definitely some facets of uh, critical thinking. So I'll note with the example here that there are currently a large, a surprising number of AI journalists uh, in international media organizations today. So this includes Heliograph, which is the Washington Post proprietary AI, which they use to report on things like the Olympics, election results, and local high school sports. This was introduced in 2017, and in the year it was introduced, it produced 850 articles for the Washington Post. So these are the categories and they're still being refined. Um, so it's just a sampling of the creativity that uh, AI is capable of having. I have one example for each, but I have pages of examples. Um, so we have audio and visual arts. And then I do video editing, which I separate from audio and visual arts because it includes facets of both. And then also because when you're looking in job descriptions and also technology descriptions, it's always treated separately. Uh, then I have writing. Uh, then I use strategy and critical thinking. And for physical movement, what I have here is an example of Disney using AI. Uh, it's called Stuntronics to take on jobs that tend to be dangerous for humans. So in California, in their park, they have AI doing uh, uh, stunts for their uh, Spider-Man character. So the next few steps, steps I'll be taking, I'm going to refine the categorization and compare job descriptions. I'm using Bowdoin's construct and low versus high skill economist construct. I'm gonna research an evaluative model for AI creative capabilities. I'm gonna index the occupation competencies to give a quantitative look at it. And I'm going to map the research agenda and figure out all the fun research I get to do next. 
And just in case you were concerned that we might be getting too close, here's an example of what AI weirdness calls the Baltimore Orioles effect. So this content was created referencing Orioles, but they didn't specify if it was the bird or the baseball team. So I'm looking forward to diving further on this. I've got lots more funny and impressive examples of AI creativity at my poster, and I might make you talk about my research. Uh, so thank you for your time, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we have Jason Ding returning. And uh, we're now looking at uh, diversity and its role in inspiration. Hi, I'm Jason Ding. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this time I will introduce another project. It's so how to present examples efficiently to help people. So if you are a designer, so you want to search for some examples to inspire your designs, you may search online and try to find some examples. So we know that examples help However, there is a lack of holistic view of presenting examples individually. So we try to put the examples in a context. So we hope to present to, so designers could have a better understanding of the design space. So they know also that the, the white space, the, the promising space they could explore. And also that uh, they don't miss the other great spots. So we want to answer the questions whether and how in context presentations of examples could help. So if we just collapse the high dimensional, the high dimensional real world is into a 2D space, just like that, uh, 100 by 100 grid. And there are some best solutions, which is like, uh, there are some best solution and also some good solutions, which is a dark color in the space. It's like a mapping of our real world. And the task is try to find the dark space, which is a high, high value good solution stuff in the space. So the, the exploration looks like that. People just create some like random dots, pixels, and try to find higher value. And to help them, we provide some, we present some examples. That's the uh, upper one, which is just like the examples in the grid, and also the examples in a list. So we call the, uh, in the grid one, is in context presentations of examples. And also the in a list is like the non-context presentations of examples. So we conducted a study with 121 participants on MTurk, and we have two example presentations, those two. And uh, also we vary the diversity of examples that we see in the subjects with low diversity of the examples, that's a lot of examples are near to each other. And also the high diversity examples, that's the, the examples are sparse. So we found that in context presentations of examples may maximize their positive impact on, de de on design ideation. So for both high diversity examples presentations and also low diversity, we could say that in context participants outperform the no context participants for each move. So each participant, they have 60 moves through to navigate the space. And we could find that for both of them. Then we want to answer why, what's the difference? Why, what, what causes that difference? So the, the difference is caused by the in context presentations of examples may incentivize different strategies of participants working with examples. So the non-context presentations, presentations will cause more fixations on the participants. But this, that's our example, that the participants will just search around one good example in the list and they never go to other space. So that's what causes their bad performance. And also the in-context participants self-reported that they use the examples to model the space, that they have an overview of the space to look for like, the good solutions. Here I, I, I appended two codes. One participant said to get an overview of the which squares will be the best. It's like, just like an overview, but not focusing on one or two good examples. And also mostly just to see how the model works, that's the underlying functions in that space and, and figure out the overall functionality or grouping of the solutions. So if you want to learn more, please go to my advisor, George Chan, because I will be responsible for the, the, the other poster. Thank you for watching.